All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mandar and the present here. That uh, nice introductions and invitations um, to this great place. And um, this is my actually first time to India and um, first time in Mumbai as well. And I'm very much impressed by the all things happening in this area and also this institute. And uh, it is my great pleasure and also honor uh, to deliver the public lecture as a first emphasis um, the invitee. And you know that the, whenever you invite it as a public lecture, uh, it's always kind of, uh, there's excitement as a respondent because um, to try to explain something that you're working on by your heart to the people that do not have the background, but it's kind of why we are doing this one in the, in the excitement. So I'll try my best to deliver the, my excitement onto the research that I'm working on, why actually I'm excited about, why actually I wish you would also get excited about. All right, so let's start from the title of my talk. They're saying the staking atomic layers and the quest for new materials in physics. So there are a few words that um, I want to explain uh, throughout my talk. The first part is this part of the staking atomic layers for the new materials. And that's probably a good starting point that I want to kind of explain. In fact, the atomic scale of the materials or this layered materials is actually quite common. Um, I mean, we all know that atom is very small and expect that how to just kind of experience such a small uh, length scale easily. But to tell the truth that everyone here that probably have cell phones or computers in your bags and in your pockets, that already contains the technologies that require atomic scale of the engineering. So think about the computer chips. Um, probably you rarely open up these computer chips, but you may always wonder what's inside of these computer chips or cell phone chips or semiconducting device. In modern semiconductor device, uh, if you just open it up, it's made of the silicon, but it's not just as simple, but it looks complicated. So you see, kind of open up the this cover of the, these chips, you see that the silicon dies contains uh, many, many components there. Uh, often that component is so small, so it's very difficult to see that with the bare eyes, but with the help of the microscope, especially electron, electron microscope, you can just zoom in. <clears throat> and you start to see that this is not a simple object. It's a rather complicated object with many, many layers. It's like the sum of the, this complicated series that a lot of the layers in there. And if you zoom in there, there's another structures. And if you just zoom in there, there's another structures. You have to zoom in quite a bit, probably 10,000, 100,000 times. And then you just reach the really core of the, this silicon chip, which is basically what you call the transistor. And this transistor is, of course, made of the mainly silicons, but there are a lot of other structures. There's metals, and there are different parts of the materials it contains that make this small elements, what you call the transistor whose basic action is basically turn off and on as a switches that control the electricity is passed through the descendants of the layers. And the size of the transistor has been shrinking down over the past centuries, uh, almost half centuries. And there's uh, the law that we call the Moore's law telling us how we can just make the transistor size small and small. It turns out at approximately every two years, we will just kind of make the size of the transistor is about half such that over the past years, we make the, this transistor size from centimeter scale now down to the, something like the 10 nanometer length scale. And 10 nanometer is about 100 atoms width, right? So if you just look at this, uh, the, the, hex, uh, the uh, main part of the transistors even further, it looks like the, now you need a really fine structures of the, or the highest resolution of the electron microscope just to take a look. And indeed, the, the core part of the transistors. Now, if you just zoom in up to, up to the uh, atomic <coughs> length scale, and this uh, all this uh, little dot is basically atoms made of silicon and silicon oxide, which is basically glass, and which actually make the dissections. But you start to see that the actual the length scale that we are dealing in this device is already down to the atomic length scale. So to make the, this type of the silicon works in your pockets, or the transistor works in the pockets as computer chips, we have to know how to deal with those kind of atomic scale of the length scale to engineer things in there and study them, right? In fact, our technology got evolved even further. So not only the silicon, so if you just make the one, make the a little bit faster device, some of the, this um, 
the uh, cellular phone chips can be made of the other than silicon, like the gallium arsenide, that's another semiconductors. But whole length, uh, the point here is now the, we know how to just make the, this uh, type of the structures really, really small scale in controllable way such that with this, this so-called molecular beam epitaxial techniques, one can create this, uh, this silicon wafer or the semiconducting wafer about 10 centimeter size, where they, if you zoom in, all this layer by layer of the control can be made throughout the very careful techniques. And this is the essential technique that we need to use to create the modern days of the semiconductor chips that allows all these electronics we enjoy can be enabled out of the, this type of capability. Now, these are the, all the engineering. I'm not going to discuss about too much of the engineering, but I want to take the, this as a spot that once you just acquire such a the high capability or higher the uh, ability of the controlling the engineering down to this atomic length scale. What kind of new things, what kind of physics we learn, or also how that use that physics back to again that's making something useful and interesting. So that's kind of main part of the, my story. So let's start with the physics that we can learn from those kind of the really uh, atomic scale of the length scale we can have the controllability. So the physics story that I want to start go back about 150 years ago. And uh, starting with this man, uh, the Professor Edwin Hall, uh, who was the uh, chair of the, uh, the Harvard physics professor back then in uh, 19, uh, 18, around the 90. Uh, but when he did the, his PhD in the Johns Hopkins University, he did the following interesting experiments. What if that you make the certain materials very thin and apply the electric currents into the, the thin materials and apply the magnetic field on the materials? What is going to happen? In 150 years ago, it's about the time that James uh, Maxwell just come up with this, uh, his, uh, uh, the summarizing the achievement of this Maxwell's four equation to describe the electrodynamics or electri electricity and magnetism, how that works, was uh, discovered around that time, right? What Hall was interested in is, say, uh, under the, this theory, applying the magnetic field, we exerted force onto the charge, moving charges that deflect the charge motion. The, his quest is basically, can I detect this a deflection of charge motion under the magnetic field by carefully measuring the voltage across the, uh, across the current directions. So he set up the following uh, instruments. Basically, he, have, uh, he has some conductors here, sending the current through this conductor and applying the magnetic field in the vertical direction of the disconductor. And then deflection of the charge, presumably electron, will happen. And then you can carefully measure the voltage across the current directions. One, can, one should be able to measure this uh, minus force of the deflections under the magnetic field by just kind of this measurement. And this is what we call the Hall effect nowadays. So what he did is basically set these things up. Uh, so uh, he used a thin materials and this apply the current, applying the magnetic field. There's a deflection force, what you call the Lorentz force, will deflect the charges and accumulate the charge into one side as positive and the other side as negative, and uh, will create the voltage drop and can measure this type of the uh, voltage drop uh, while sending the current and make the ratio between that, uh, the voltage to the current, what you call the whole voltage, can be measured under the magnetic field. And obviously, as you increase the magnetic field, there is an increasing of the Lorentz force and there is more voltage uh, developed uh, happens. In other words, this whole resistance will increase with the magnetic field. If you just simply solve this type of the relation uh, out of the Maxwell's equations, and then you can realize that indeed it's a whole voltage, whole resistance will linearly increase the magnetic field and this is something that he measured. And now it's called the Hall effect. And this whole effect is one of the important properties one can use to measure the charge or property of the charge, especially how much charge is in there uh, throughout this type of simple measurement. One behind the story, however, here is following. When Hall tried to measure this experiment, he tried various different type of conductors. And it becomes quite obvious this conductor that he, use, uh, he has to use should be very, very thin. Otherwise, that amount of current flowing there, you don't generate enough the whole signal to be able to measure in the uh, technologies in the late 19th century. So you may ask uh, what is the thinnest material he could use in 150 years ago, right? I know this is a popular lecture, but I can ask you guys, right? 
can you imagine what is the thinnest material one can come around about 150 years ago? Gold. Yes, it is gold. So the people know how to make the very thin leaf of the gold back then. So he used about the one micron thickness of the gold, about 100 times thinner than our hair size. Right? And that's how the, we know that can make the, this uh, type of the technology back then. And using this very thin leaf of the gold, he barely manages its signals and just to kind of do this nice measurement. And of course, afterward, people know that how to make the, this uh, thin materials in various different ways. One of the ways is actually using semiconductor. Exactly the silicon technology I was mentioning about the uh, sem uh, semiconductor chips. It takes another 100 years and um, uh, the, uh, to come up with the new measurement actually appears using semiconductor under the very strong magnetic field. About 100 years later, when semiconductor technology got started evolved, and people know how to deal with this semiconductor very carefully, uh, this person who gave actually probably a lecture about two years ago, I heard, yeah, uh, the uh, Professor Klaus von Klitsing, actually did the following experiments. Simply take the, this, the uh, just computer chip that I just mentioned, uh, so-called this uh, silicon uh, uh, CMOS, uh, complementary metal oxide uh, semiconductor chips, and apply the strong enough magnetic field using the superconducting uh, the magnets, and just measure the same whole effect. And the reason that the, uh, his motivation is to just try to look at this so-called this in the extreme quantum limit, and what is going to happen, right? And then he uses silicons and using this gate electrode that I mentioned and applying the voltage on the gate electrode, you can just accumulate a very thin layer of the charge layer on the surface of the silicons. And he just kind of apply the, um, the magnetic field and measure the whole measurement. And we expect more or less a thing like this. And the slope will give us information about giving the information on how much charge accumulated. In fact, when he did this experiment, by surely just complete surprise that he find that he found the result is not like this, but something like this. It's increasing, but not continuously, but it's rather discontinuously with some steps. And now this effect is being called a quantum or effect, and certainly that this is quite a unique behavior. First of all, that we know that this quantum mechanics really goes on in these problems. Part of the reason is the whole mark of the quantum mechanics is something discrete, and this size of the step actually appears precisely, but certain kind of rules there, and uh, it kind of discreetly appears, that really smells like the quantum mechanics plays an important role. And not surprisingly, this effect is, can be described by the quantum mechanics. In fact, that the <coughs> uh, foundation of the explanation of this quantum effect comes from the 50 years of before its discovery, the Leo Landau at the Soviet Union back then studied about the how this the quantum mechanics dictate electron move under the magnetic field and simply solving Schrodinger equations that discovered a few years before the, he studied about this problem. Simply that in quantum mechanical law of the, this, uh, the uh, charge motion under the magnetic field can be explained in the following way. So think about this whole bar that we send the current, and I just mentioned that the voltage across, uh, developed across these current fractions due to the deflection force of this, uh, the magnetic field. But if you just look at this, uh, the current flow through this, uh, the, uh, along this uh, direction of the current, if you really carefully look at this charge motion in there, it's not simply just kind of straight off. Because the magnetic field is just kind of circulating around, so-called cyclotron motion is happening, right? And, that, and the drift along this kind of current direction, and that's how this current flow. Then, of course, if you apply the, uh, the quantum mechanics, what quantum mechanics will do is basically quantize the cyclotron orbits into the, this kind of, uh, can be described the wave functions that are around this quantized motion. Right. And this, the quantization of cyclotron motion, will basically quantize uh, the orbits such that within this orbit, there's a, the set number of the set quantity of the magnetic field can be trapped in there, what you call this flux quanta, is trapped in this, uh, this circle. And that's basically what Landau tells us. And how many actually this, uh, the magnetic quanta is trapped in there is, of course, the discrete numbers we can count may actually explain that discrete steps of this, uh, the quantum effect that what uh, the uh, Professor Kalitzing discovered. In fact, 
the better way to describe the, all these things is using so-called quantum wave functions, uh, psi, that uh, just uh, described here, usually is complex number, where there are two quantity follows. One is its magnitude, which you can find uh, described in terms of real numbers. And the other one is uh, this phase, which describes this phase of the complex number. So using that concept, basically we can explain that why there is a step appears in this uh, the quantum artifact. Basically, this quantum wave function that I just uh, described, uh, the describing this, uh, the uh, quantized orbits, has uh, the phase. But in these steps, there is some regularity. Right? The first step, if we call this is the first uh, step of the height, second step appears about half of the, the first step, and third step appears is uh, about one third of the first step height, and fourth as a one fourth and so on. Right? So there are certain regularities that all more places there is some integer numbers actually hide into the, this interesting uh, the behavior. Where this integer number comes from? That integer number, it turns out, if you just look at the, uh, the, the quantum mechanical wave function described the cyclotron orbits, the phase angle will just kind of circulating around when electrons, they make the, this one cyclotron orbits, and how many times of the, this phase angle circulating around, or, around this, uh, the cyclotron orbits, will just uh, give us that integer numbers, because uh, the winding of the, this phase angle must be integer number. So if it is one wind of the phase angle, that's a one, that correspond to the first step. If this phase angle wind around twice, so when the cyclotron orbit happens, that's two, and winding number three becomes third steps and so on. So that beautifully explained that why there is a discrete steps and why the step is so exact because that underlying the, uh, the mathematics related with the quantum wave function dictated, with, dictated by this integer number, which actually is completely discrete and precise. Right? This tells us that the interesting lesson. Once you get down to such a thin limits, that we start to see the interesting physics actually appears. And this interesting physics is related with quantum physics, which actually related with the discreteness of the, this nature. Right? And you see that this is also an interesting part of the phase of the wave function plays quite an important role to understand this type of the intri intriguing physics there. It turns out the quantum mechanics dictate another interesting phase. And that's related with so-called the uh, quantum spin of half. <coughs> We know that electron is a charged object, and most of the condensed matter physicists are dealing with electrons because they are dictating the electronic property of the materials we are dealing with. Electron as a, is a fundamental particle, has a few different properties, and one of the important properties is spin. And the classical way that you can describe the electron spin is electron is a charged object, you can think about this is sphere is a basically electron, and you can just turn around these uh, this spheres, and make the this spins there, and that will just kind of create a circulating electric current around here, which will create its own magnetic moments, right? In this classical picture, of course, this magnetic moment can just point out any directions, any three-dimensional directions, right? So you can think about this magnetic moment as a vector that I need three components to describe about this magnetic moment directions, right? But what is the real part of this electron? as a quantum mechanical object, it turns out to describe this three-dimensional vector of the magnetic moment. You don't need the three components. You need only two components. In other words, even if this magnetic moment is pointing in the x directions, in horizontal directions, somehow quantum mechanics dictate that I can use up and down only just two directions to describe about this direction in the x direction. Right. This is a little bit weird. Uh, think about this uh, three-dimensional object, but I need only two components to describe that. In fact, uh, this uh, two components actually provide yet another very interesting and intriguing property onto the electron spins. That's a related following statement. So if I just have the electron and describe the electron's quantum mechanical state with the electron uh, the wave functions, it turns out when I just uh, turn around the electron 360 degree, this actually comes back almost its own, but with some difference, with negative sign in front of this wave function, right? So this is a really weird type of things. It's something like that you just watch me, and then I'm just turn around the 360 degree, and it's come back to me, but for the, if, if, if it was an electron, it doesn't come back to its own, but it has a negative sign in front of it, right? But since this is a negative sign, I know how to get rid of it, how? I just turn around once more, then I have another negative to negate this one, 
right? That's precisely what happens to the electron wave functions. It has to go through the twice of the turning to its get, uh, get back to its own. If it's just turn around once, basically it just kind of have the, this weird negative size in front of it, right? And this actually related with some of the intriguing topological structure, in fact, right? In fact, you can just create a very analogous mathematical object doing this one. That's actually Mobius strip. Probably you just once tried to make the, this type of weird strips. If you used to have the, the strip of the paper, instead of you just connect them to make the band, if you just twist it and just connect them, this is a way that we can make the, this Mobius strip. And there's a one intriguing factor about this Mobius strip. Imagine that I have the electrons that are sitting on the one surface of this Mobius strip, right? And just kind of carefully just turn around the electron along this path and turn around 360 degrees along the surface of Mobius strip. You will find out electron will not come by its own, but direction of the spin is opposite even if you make the uh, 360 degree turn, right? Same way that I just described. However, if you make the another turn, it's then it's come back its own, right? So precisely this start to tell us electron spin actually carries some of the intriguing this topological structures that are related with the, this type of uh, the physics, right? Now this tells us quite the intriguing part. So electron spin is a very weird in a sense uh, that uh, it has kind of some interesting phase properties. In fact, this can be generalized together with what I just mentioned about this quantized orbit. And generally, in quantum mechanical object, this type of the phase argument either relay with these orbits under the magnetic field or the ideas of an electron spin that are turning around carries all these quantum mechanical phases can be all described by the so-called Barry's phase, which actually uh, written by Sir Barry's about uh, the 30 years, 50 years ago now, uh, that describe about this intriguing the quantum mechanical nature of the phase of the wave functions described in such a way. And once you have the, this make the, this electron in such a way, it could be quite intriguing. However, you start to see that there is a kind of two discrete stories I just mentioned. One is basically phase of the um, wave function on the magnetic field, right? Create this orbits and uh, the magnetic field flux that is captured uh, by this orbit. And the other one is the uh, electron spins that I'm just turning around. That sounds like the two completely different objects. Indeed, it is uh, two different objects under the non-relativistic quantum mechanics, right? We know that in the beginning of the 20th century, there's a two important pillars of the physics. One is a special relativity uh, uh, developed by Einstein. And the other one is this quantum mechanics developed by many people, but I just write down Schrodinger who just wrote the Schrodinger equations. In this non-relativistic quantum mechanics uh, described by Schrodinger equation, the quantum mechanical spin that I just mentioned about the electron is just kind of add-on quantity. Right. You describe everything about the Schrodinger equations to describe the orbital motion, as we just discussed about this uh, Landau's quantization of problems. Right. But then spin is just add-on. But deeper physics actually was discovered soon after uh, this, uh, the uh, development of the quantum mechanics, when uh, Paul, Dirac, Paul Dirac just tried to combine these special relativities with uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, try to write down this uh, completely relativistic and quantum mechanical equations, now called the Dirac equations, it becomes clear, in fact, the spin is delayed, uh, kind of deeply related with the charge motions as well. According to the Dirac equations, it turns out when you just kind of accelerate the particles or charged particle, more precisely spin, uh, have particles, the level of the speed of the light, then there is an intriguing connection between the spin and its velocity or the, uh, the momentum more precisely can be made uh, according to the uh, Dirac equations. What happens is that more, uh, direction of the spin should be either parallel or antiparallel of this momentum direction, whether it becomes particle or antiparticle. Right? And this deep relation is uh, quite intriguing. Because now, spin degree of freedom is not in a sense just com completely kind of free, but somehow it's deeply tied with its momentum direction, where the electron moves, right? So how to prove this type of this uh, intriguing, uh, the, the property of the relativistic the particles? Well, one way is basically going to the really large system, the 
particle accelerators. Because as you see here, that only when you accelerate the electron up to the speed of the light, this property can be seen. Right? But imagine that if you have the, this, uh, the Large Hadron uh, Collider and you accelerate the electrons in there, and what you, what you expect to see here is, uh, according to the Dirac's equations, this particle or electrons, the spin direction will be tied with its momentum directions. So whenever an electron is moving around this gigantic rings accelerated with the speed of the light, uh, close the speed of the light, then the spin is actually tied with momentum, such that when electrons is moved once, it's go back to these negative signs in front of it, it actually have to go to twice to get back to its own wave function states, right? Unfortunately, this is a very difficult to uh, just measure the width, kind of this change of the minus the wave function differences in such a the large scale of the experiments. Then what can we do? Well, here comes kind of interesting trick of this so-called condensed matter physics I have been working on. So condensed matter physics is dealing with the materials. And as you see the materials, as you as showed in the transit as a good example, if you just zoom in, there are many, many atoms, many, many electrons, right? Usually about 10 to the 23rd, uh, the electrons, the ions into the, this small area of the cubic centimeter scale, uh, cubic centimeter scales, uh, cubic centimeter of the materials that we are dealing with, right? So it's complicated, right? But over the probably 100 years or so, condensed matter physicists have developed how to describe this the complicated system one by one in quantum mechanical way, right? Especially the materials I'm going to tell you today is based on the some, somewhat simpler system. If you just look at the periodic table, there are many elements that, that can all the participate into the rather complicated system. Let me just take the one simple example as a good starting point. And that simple example I want to choose is carbon. And carbon, part of the reason is that we're all made of the carbons uh, other than uh, the water, right? And carbon is number six elements uh, in this periodic table. There are six electrons can participate in all this chemical bond. Uh, but turns out that two electrons are basically locked in the core and four electrons make the, this, the chemical bond. There are few different ways to arrange of this, this four electrons that can make the chemical bond. The one way to make the, this, uh, the arrangement to make the chemical bond is so-called sp2 carbon bond. Now, this is a rather complicated uh, terms that uh, the chemists use, but if you look at this uh, simple diagram, you probably notice that uh, you've been seeing this type of molecular uh, diagrams before. This is benzene molecules, that there are six carbon atoms make the, this chemical bond, and there's a hydrogen atom is decorating out, outward. But if you just notice each of the carbon atoms, there are three chemical bonds to make this new, the chemical bond as, uh, the, to its nearest uh, the elements, right? So each of the chemical bond per carbon atom will just cost one electron. Then since I mentioned there are four electrons uh, per carbon atom can participate in uh, the chemical bond, there's one electron per carbon atom can be used for the something else. And often, this is a one electron, so what you call the pi electron, is just hovering around all different carbon sites, makes so-called delocalized electron networks there, right? So as I said, the carbon is basic elements to consist of the most of these organic molecules. And whenever you just look at the organic molecule, you can think about the following way. Each of the carbon atom donate one electron can slushing around this network of the hexagons. Basically, this is a physicist view the how to look at these organic molecules, right? It turns out there's a one generalization you can quickly make that this kind of organic molecule even bigger. The way that it just can do that is you can make the, this either sockable like the shapes or this uh, the long one dimensional shapes or two dimensional shape or even just make the, the stacks of the two dimensions and so on. Turns out that all of these elements or all of this uh, the matrix actually has a name. Of course, the graphite is something that we are most familiar with. But also, over the time, people just discovered not only cartoon, all of these, these materials actually do exist. In the 80s, the chemist actually found that the, uh, these fluorines, what you call the buckyballs, that consist of this, uh, the, uh, the benzene type of the molecules that connected together make the this spherical form, right? In the 90s, that, uh, the scientists in Japan just uh, discovered that the, the extended, version, extended version of the fluorine into the, this, the straw type of this uh, network of the carbons in what you call the carbon nanotubes. Actually, I did my PhD on this carbon nanotube in the 90s, late 90s. Uh, but then people just realized, 
Well, there are those kind of system also they tied with the graphite. The very basic elements that describe all these materials, which is basically one single atomic sheet of the graphite, what we call the graphene, is basic materials to describe all of them. In a sense, starting with the, this uh, 2D uh, atomic sheet of the graphene, if you stack them together, you get the graphite. But if you just roll this graphene up, you can get the nanotube. Or if you just kind of fold this graphene up, you can get the fluorine. So we know that these are all kind of connected, but the elements of the most important part is the graphene, right? So in the um, early 2000s, just after actually I got my PhD, I just mentioned that people already knew that there are kind of intriguing these connections of the, those kind of carbon materials. And then natural thing you can ask is, how the electron can move inside of these materials? It turns out they're applying the quantum mechanics uh, to the, the system. You will find some somewhat intriguing features. So look at this graphene network that I just mentioned. Just uh, let me zoom in one of the, this, uh, the units of the, this network, which is basically hexagons of the carbons, right? But if you stare at these carbon atoms carefully, you can recognize that you can categorize or classify this carbon atom, six carbon atom, in two different groups. Let me just paint them as a one red groups and the other one as blue groups. And red versus blue groups, their chemical bonding structure is actually opposite, right? So take the red atoms and flip it around, you get blue, uh, blue atoms. So there is a so-called inversion symmetry is there. So how to describe the electrons moving inside of the, this network of this, uh, the chicken net type of the carbon network? The quantum mechanics tells us that there are the bases you have to set it up. And of course, these bases can be naturally set into the red carbon atoms versus blue carbon atoms. And right description of this quantum mechanical description of the electron is basically so-called the quantum mechanical superposition of the, these two, right? So you start to see sense of this two componentness, right? This two components that is something that I use to describe the electron spins, and they have the very intriguing the phase relation, battery phase actually comes around, Precisely can be analog uh, analogically constructed into the, this type of this network of the carbon. Hence, to describe the electron wave function in here, basically you need a two component and how you add up or quantum mechanics superimpose impose this kind of two component becomes important. So there are very analogous description of this uh, spin type of description appears. What you call is a pseudo spin description of this, uh, the quantum mechanical wave function of the electron in graphene. One can take this a little bit more seriously. And already in the 60 years ago, uh, when uh, uh, Philip Wallace, uh, the Canadian physicist, uh, tried to describe the electron motion in the graphene or graphite back then. He just come around, in fact, solving the Schrodinger equation to describe these wave functions. The, you will get the very the similar structures, what Dirac equations that describe the electron at the, relativist, uh, the, at the relativistic limits can be analytically described into the, this type of the quasi-relativistic descriptions describe this uh, charge motion in the graphene. And there, basically, again, that spins of, or more precisely, pseudo spin of the electron is tied with deeply with the direction of the electrons on the circulating around these band structures. So all these things start to tell us somehow the analytical, the quantum mechanical, relative quantum mechanical description becomes very important to understand the electric charge motion into the graphene. So that basically add up to another excitement. It's not only the graphene, in the two-dimensional sheet of the carbon is the important elements to understand that what the, uh, the how this all this low-dimensional carbon materials actually works. But on the top of that, in the physics-wise, we actually expect something interesting things happen due to the, this analogy of this charge dynamics in the graphene to the relativistic quantum mechanics. So that was a situation around the 2000s already the physicists and chemists and material scientists working on these carbon materials start to realize, well, that might be interesting that work on the graphene, you may actually discover something. So that's precisely about the time that I actually just get the PhD and uh, completed for postdocs, and then I start my own lab at the Columbia University back then. And I decided maybe this is interesting enough problems I want to work on. Right. So the first thing then we have to find out is, okay, so we know that graphene actually can exist and may show this type of interesting behavior. 
But then next question is, how can we create the graphene sheets, right? Well, in 2000, nobody knows how to make the graphene. But we know that graphene can exist inside of graphite. So the idea that we had with my first the year students of the Yambojang was the following things. Since the, the, the pens are made of the graphite, and indeed if you just look at the under the microscope, electron microscope, uh, the pencil lead consists of the, the stacks of the graphite, right? So when you just kind of grab the pencil, write on the, pa write on the paper, you will probably cleave on some of the little piece of the graphite, or maybe some perhaps in graphene. So that was the idea that we started with. So my, uh, the first generation students in Ambojang was kind of courageous enough. So we discussed maybe instead of this uh, microscopic pencil, what if we just made the, the small scale of pencil? called the nano pencil. So Yambo actually went through that kind of following procedures. First, he just carved down the chunk of the graphite into make the small pieces. So using the microfabrications, he, he made this kind of little blocks of this of the carbon, something like the micron size, right? And then take the, this kind of blocks of the carbons and attach them onto the AFM cantilever. And this is about the, um, 10 times smaller than your hair width. So you can see the really, really tiny nano pencil can be made in that way. And then grab this cantilever that will graphite blocks in that uh, they attach it and carefully scratch it onto the substrate to hope and hope that uh, some little piece of the graphite, hopefully the graphene, can be deposited onto the substrate. And this was a really wild idea. However, it actually worked. He carefully just cleave it off, and those thin crystal lights actually uh, cleave it down, and we just can kind of wire them up, just electrically probe that under the, uh, the magnetic field, measure the whole effect. We start to see that this quantum oscillation start to appear, tells us that, that indeed quantum mechanical ac action is happening in this very thin sample. Back then, the Yambo and I went down to the, about this five nanometer thickness of the sample, which consists of about uh, 10 layers of the graphene sheets in there. Right. So it was not the single layer that we aimed, but we were very close because, well, we're starting from about millimeter size of thick uh, graphite and now get down to the same something like the nanometer. So we went down about six orders of the magnitude and we just left one, one last order of magnitude to get down to the graphene. So around to 2004, when we just kind of get to our first result, we got so excited, we started to wrote the paper. And then about to submit the paper, and then we heard about the rumor. And saying that, well, you know that we are not the only one that doing this crazy type of the experiments. And soon after we just submit the paper, we saw the preprint coming from the other groups, actually, that describe very similar physics. And that was the paper done by Andre Gaim and Kostya Novoselov and the um, University of Manchester. And this paper, when I just read this paper, I got shocked, kind of, couple of shocks, actually three shocks, more, more precisely. The first shock is, of course, oh gee, that we got completely scooped. And that was actually two years of the, our hard efforts. And that was my almost first experiment we did. And it was another good feeling, right? And we worked some things for two years for your hearts, and especially so the first, uh, first experiments, you got completely scooped. And it is completely scooping. A part of the reason is we, I just told you that we went down to the about 10 layers and still we have a one order magnitude to get down to the, uh, the uh, really ultimate limit of single layer of the graphene sheets. And these folks actually get down to single sheets and do the experiments. And the very similar experiment, uh, the result that we got. So we, our data is basically subset of their data, right? Okay, so good. So we got defeated, that's fine. But the next thing is then, how they actually get the single layer, right? I mean, we just, we just come up with this elegant idea of the nano pencil. There must be something in there, right? So when we just kind of carefully read this paper, we got the second shock. And the second shock comes from the fact that they use a really simple techniques. Anyone work on the graphene or heard about the graphene probably heard about this scotch tape stories, right? They literally use the scotch tape many, many times and get down to the real thin layers and they put it onto their substrate. Such a simple technique, completely scoobles, right? That was our second shock, right? And third shock comes up a few years later and they actually got the Nobel Prize out of that work. <laughs> 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 so that was good. 
But back then, uh, Yambo was really disappointed, not because of Nobel Prize, but because we got completely screwed out of two years of the work, right? And it was such a simple technique. And then we just kind of decided, Yambo, go and get this, uh, this cash tape into the stationary store in front of our school. And let's try out then whether it works. Actually, it worked. Within a week, we created a single layer. This method is now well established, and you can even find out the good recipes in the YouTube. And you can do it in your kitchen, indeed, literally, if you have the piece of the graphite. Using the sketch tape, you can just successfully peel it off. You can get the single down to single layers. You can just kind of find out that with not sophisticated things, but simple optical microscope, you can actually find out the single layer with the eyes, right? And if you use carefully using AFM, atomic force microscope, you can measure, you, indeed, they are just one single atom unit cell, thickness of materials, thinnest materials we can get rather simply, right? Although this is a rather simple thing so you can get, of course, you can make the device out of it, and from that part, you need to go through the all so-called microfabrication techniques. People often use making the semiconductor uh, chips. Uh, using graphene rather than silicon, you can make the device, and start kind of study about their properties. And then if you just do that, you'll find out quite intriguing things. Part of the reason is, from the beginning, this is a, just a one atom thickness of materials, is a quantum, a quant completely quantum mechanical materials. First thing you notice, as intriguing physics is following, if you measure Hall effect under the magnetic field, how this deflection of these charges happen, not surprisingly, they also show this stepwise increase. Just ignore the blue things, but focus on red one, which is whole effect, right? You start to see the formula steps. But then you notice that there's one difference. The step size, I mentioned that first step is one, second is two, third one, uh, third one is third, and this half and one third, fourth, uh, that appears. But the step size doesn't look like that, that, that uh, level. It turns out first step size is half, that one is one to six and one ten. And that's a step size. In other words, if I call this one, next one is a three, and the next one is a five, right? So if I just can put these numbers, step appears a two, six, 10, 14, and what is next that you expect? 18, right? How to generalize the numbers? Two, six, 10, 14. It turns out that number is a four times of this half integer, right? That's a difference from that what I just kind of mentioned about semiconductors. Something intriguing things are happening here. What is what makes those kind of things as appears a half integer rather than full integer? It turns out that physics is related with something that I mentioned up to now, right? I told you in the graphene basically there is a pseudo spins that describe there's a kind of red and blue carbon atoms, right? And these two components actually create something like the spin-like the structures, what you call the pseudo spin. And the other part is, well, electron moving inside of the graphene sheet more or less mimic the, like the drug equations, relativistic the quantum equations, quantum mechanical equations, which means that when I just kind of send the electrons around and make the cyclotron orbits, like the electron moving the Large Hadron Collider at the speed of the light, right? It just kind of carries its pseudo spin directions along this momentum directions and uses spin around, right? But then you have to think about another component I dimension. Well, pseudo spin carries pseudo spin like the real spin carries its baddest moment, that is uh, uh, the uh, uh, phase, which means electron has to turn around twice to go back its own, right? So precisely those kind of fact that you have to turn twice to get back on means if you just turn around once, you only turn around half of the turn, which means. Instead of we have two pi of the angle, you got the pi of the angle. And that's precisely the reason why we have the, this half integers. Basically, incompleteness of the rotations coming from this battery phase tells you about this half integers. So what you see here is a, such a simple system that you can just get a very intriguing and deep physics all together with kind of all, uh, this kind of interesting way. But not only just the deep physics that we just kind of interested in, Turns out, this graphene becomes quite important materials for the future applications. Again, graphene is highly conducting materials. It's so thin, so light can go through. As you see in the microscope, you can see there's faint colors. But also, the carbon network here is a very strong network. 
Therefore, it has a kind of it, it very intriguing or very uh, uh, high quality of the mechanical properties, or you also it conducted it very well. All of these properties are combinations. Actually, people have been thinking about using this material for the various different type of the applications. I'm not going to touch upon all of these things really carefully, but certainly over the past 15 years, people got really excited about using graphene as a, this, uh, the application materials based on the atomic thin, atomically thin uh, system. But another important aspect of the graphene research, as a good example, is a very first step showing that how one can get very atomically thin materials. It turns out it's not only graphene. Nature has provided us many different materials, atomically thin, uh, can be possible. So graphene, out of graphite is a good example. Now this thin layer materials, that there's a hexaboron, it's like the graphene like the materials, but instead of carbon, it's made of the boron and nitrogen. Turns out this is good insulators, often it's called white graphite. You can also thin it down to down to monoatomic layer. The whose low the materials called the transition metal dye, charcoal dye, some of the oxides, some of the organic materials, organic, inorganic materials, but nature gave us that many materials that the, the, all this chemical bond is within the layer, and between this layer is weakly hold like the graphite, such that using the sky tape, you can just peel them off one by one. Not only using the sky tape, over the time, people actually have developed a way how can grow this material layer by layer in larger scale for the applications. Another exciting part is, unlike the graphene, which is just kind of good conductor um, or intriguing conductor, turns out that different materials actually have different electrical properties. Some of them are semiconductors, some of them are good superconductors, some of them become magnetic. There are all sorts of different type of material quality appears by choosing different type of host. And the other exciting part is because they can actually cleave down to one single atomic layer or they can grow down to one atomic layer, in principle, you can just grab them and just put them together again, right? So step them together in the different order to make this so-called heterostructures out of it, right? So in this type of the uh, possibility, we can imagine following things, right? You can just kind of make the stacks of the system all consist of different layers. So this is electron microscope, not a, uh, not a joke, but realities. One can actually cleave it down to the all different materials and you pick them up one by one and restack these three-dimensional structures. However, each of the, this layer now consists of the many different types of the materials, right? Now you start to see that there's stark comparisons. The, uh, the, 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 uh, compared to the, this MB grown sample that I showed you semiconductors before, right? Layer by layer control of the growth. Now very similar way, we can just kind of make the this system layer by layer. But the big difference here is all each individual atomic layer can have the different functionalities. Why this is more exciting? The part of the excitement comes from that all this ingredient that we are just dealing with can have the different electronic properties. And yet, you can just stack them together to make these quasi three dimensional structures with the different type of the functionalities. And indeed, in this type of the functionalities, in terms of application, we can gain a lot of the, the diverse the application. One can make the in, uh, very fast transistors, one can make the very sensitive the optical sensors, one can make the light emitting uh, 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 diode, ultra thin uh, uh, the photovoltaic cells, biosensors, and all of this, because it is atomically thin material, they are red, naturally flexible, so you can make them as an the rigid electronics, but may flexible electronics. So in terms of application, you can see that starting from the graphene, diversifying uh, the your materials in the very different 2D materials, there are a lot of possibilities you can simply open up for the new applications. But rather than dwelling on this, uh, the many different applications we can just set up, I want to kind of end my stories going back to the one intriguing another physics stories out of the, uh, the enabled by uh, this type of this, uh, this stacking uh, atomic scale materials. Not only you just kind of choose different materials to stack. By the way, if you choose the same material, you can make that rather intriguing structures. Here's a good example, right? Let me just take the two graphene sheets, but just kind of stack them together. But when you stack them, not only just stack kind of in the direct way, but what if I just kind of give some of the angle difference? This is so-called the twisted angle difference. But although I just kind of stack two graphene layer, you start to see that 
end result looks quite different, right? So there's complicated patterns appears, but if you just carefully look, there is a, some regularity appears. And this regularity is what we call the so-called Moare patterns, usually appears when you just bring these two similar materials together with some of the twisting angle, right? Do we actually expect something intriguing things happen in those kind of structures? In fact, actually, somebody think about those kind of intriguing structures that usually comes around so-called commensuration in commensuration problems. And the somebody was Douglas of Shadows, who actually wrote a very in influential books called this uh, Gödel, Esch, and Bach, Eternal Golden Braid. And that was uh, the one of the million sellers in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and in this book, actually, he describes a very intriguing part of the connections between this Gödel's incomplete theorems with uh, Escher's painting, with the music of Bach, and then that's kind of all kind of intriguing connections in terms of cognitive science. I don't want to kind of describe everything about there because it's uh, intriguing and interesting books, but also kind of beyond the, uh, my descriptions that in short talk. But at least I can just give you some hint, a hint of the, what he was describing actually can be well captured by uh, this nice book, uh, nice painting done by the Asher. And this Asher's painting is uh, called this, uh, the relativities. And you see that most, uh, like the most, most of Asher's painting, it's rather intriguing. It's a space can, if you follow through this and it's going up or going down, but it comes back, it's almost like feeling of the mobile strip that I just mentioned is there. And most of the Asher strip actually tells us something like uh, this intriguing part of this, um, the uh, geometries. And another interesting, intriguing part is this, um, uh, the Bach's music that actually, uh, uh, all right, so I think, well, I cannot make the, this animation. Uh, but if you just look at the Bach's, uh, these canons, or called the endless rising canon, you can see also very intriguing, this kind of circulation, but it's not just kind of simply repeating, but there is a kind of intriguing, the structures appears on the PGDC. And that's all kind of related with all this uh, Hofschild's claim about how to make the, all these connections in the cognitive science way. And the reason that actually he got interested in actually dated back to his PhD work. Turns out, the Hofschild was actually a physics major and got the PhD under the uh, guidance of this, uh, the one year to get the PhD in the theoretical condensed matter physics the describing about the commensuration and commensuration issues in his thesis. And in fact, in his book, he just plotted out this so-called G plot, which actually direct from his thesis and this is basically energy and the uh, spectrum, energy spectrums of the electrons moving under the magnetic field in periodic electrical potential. It turns out this problem is exactly hit this uh, issues of the commensuration in commensurations. Later on, when you apply this magnetic field and just associated quantum effect appears in, it turns out all this the energy spectrum is deeply related with some of the structures that appears into the, this quantum mechanical uh, quantum Hall effects. It looks rather complicated structures, but if you just look at these structures carefully, there's some of the orders there. It is in fact actually fractal structures. The self-similarity appears in this type of the spectrum. Well, fractal, as we know, is complicated, but there's hidden orders. Turns out that hidden orders can be described by the two integer numbers that relate to this. When Hofschild actually wrote this book in the late uh, 70s and early 80s, that this type of the description only remains in the theoretical world and experimental realization was quite hard. But when it comes around, this type of the graphene sheets, all the, the, the 2D layers with the twisting angle, one can actually create the very analogous problems and apply the magnetic field. One can start to see the intriguing quantum effect appears that something like this. This is a magnetic field and this is density. You start to see that your whole effect, uh, whole, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the magnetic resistance actually shows a rather complicated patterns. If you just draw these uh, patterns, turns out it uh, can be all the described by the integer numbers again, but except the one integer number that describes simple quantum effect, you need two integer numbers precisely related with this, uh, the Diophantine equation described this uh, Hofschild's spectrum is exactly appears there. So this is another example. By simply just stack these atoms together, one starts to see that this beautiful physics 
or more precise beautiful mathematical structures also appears and experimentally prove in this kind of system also tells us that what kind of intriguing physics we can just kind of learn from this type of the atomic stacks that we can create. Well, I would say this is just the beginning. I just mentioned there are many different types of the two-dimensional electron system, right? Simply just break down these electrons or growing this system, you can come up with many different types of the two-dimensional atomic layer. Some of them are metal, some of them are semiconductor, superconductors, magnets, what kind of things do you expect when you just kind of put them together, right, in this uh, dissimilar metal, this is dissimilar materials? What kind of things do you expect when you just change uh, their stacking angles? And these are all kind of not largely answered problems we are actually actually working on to understand the, behind, the physics behind of that, and as well as some of the useful devices one can realize out of this type of the combination. That's basically the end of the stories. If you want to learn a little bit more about this physics, as well as the device aspect, I would invite you that the tomorrow's I'm giving another seminar, but this is, uh, the tomorrow's seminar will be a little bit more professional, so I will just use more of the physics jargons there, but at least kind of you can get the sense what kind of things we can learn, or what kind of things we can just make out of these atomic stacks together. I hope that I just kind of deliver enough the excitement that we have in this system, uh, but with this, I will end my talk. Thank you. <laughs>